Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends. How are you tonight? This is JCB Live and in a very unusual happy hour. Maybe, arguably, one of the most unusual I've ever lived and you will ever see. All the things I'm going to share, why? We're going to be with my friend Sabrina Wenneth. She's an incredible winemaker, five generation of winemaking with the famous Hess Collection. She owns wineries all around the world, including an amazing one in the heart of Napa Valley and one of the most incredible modern art museum. I wanted to interview her and she is a very famous, highly accomplished Oxford graduate, of course, ladies and gentlemen, Swiss British raised psychotherapist. Guess what she proposed? Jean Charles. What about if we reverse the wall? You sit in your comfortable velvet sofa in your red room, and I'm the one psychoanalyzing you. I'm the one going into your head, your dreams, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun doing that. As you discover Sabrina, how could I say no? Her charm, her beautiful temple, her irresistible smile made me say yes. So dear friends, are you ready to meet the famous Sabrina herself. She has her own practice. So after this, you may want to call her because I assume after what we'll see, we all need a lot of help. Here she is. Wow, what an introduction, Jean Charles. Amazing. Bonjour, bonsoir. Bonjour. Bonsoir. <laughs> and I don't say to your health, I'm going to say to your mind and to my mind and our minds together. To, to our sanities and to the next 40 minutes. Mm. I cannot wait. And when you said that, I started to shiver. I had a moment of very high anxiety, very similar to Mel Brooks in this very famous movie. I started to sweat. My forehead was wrinkling and I said, shall I really do this? And as you know, you're so convincing. I said, why not? Let's do it. Well, my thinking was we know each other socially. And so you're often in Jean Charles mode. And I was like, wouldn't it be fascinating both for me to actually be able to ask you the questions that I'm genuinely intrigued by. And my sense is that your audience would also be interested in these questions. So this is going to be a more alive and dynamic and slightly scary because it is a little bit vulnerable. We have no idea where we're going. We spoke for two minutes yesterday. You have no idea what questions are coming your way. And we're riding that wave between psychotherapy and broadcasting stuff on the internet, which don't usually go that well together, but we're going to see how it goes. I'm, I'm going to take over the session, if you don't mind, since I'm, I'm the psychotherapist in charge. And a few things, you know, just to, I think, keep in mind. One, we're going to forget that we have an audience. Because I know you are often an amazing entertainer. And we are going to try and forget about an audience. Because I love what I do. Because often when you're having really honest conversations, it's very alive and it's just interesting in and of itself. So we're gonna hope that honesty and realness will forge the way for the next 40 minutes. I've already forgotten about all our viewers. I'm all yours, <laughs> as I've always dreamt to be, one-on-one -on -one to go into my mind. And Sabrina, I need to warn you, this is the first time ever I've dared saying yes on such a journey. So okay. I Right. Yes, it's, it's very exciting. I'm not sure what to do with all the innuendos, but we will, we will work with them. I think number two is my prediction, knowing you a little bit socially, is that you're likely to go to positive and to passion. And I am going to try and redirect you to probably areas that you're slightly less comfortable in, because my sense is, especially in 2020, where everyone's had a difficult time, what's most inspiring is actually to hear people's challenges 
and how they kind of navigate them and how they've overcome those challenges. So I'm just letting you know that so that you don't think, oh, this is going to be dull watching. I don't think it will be. I think people would really genuinely be interested to hear kind of the underbelly of Jean Charles, like things that you've struggled with. So if I go there, you are always welcome to say, pass, I don't want to answer that question. And I'm not going to, I don't, I, I hope I'm not going to ask anything inappropriate, but if I do, let me know. Because that's another piece I haven't Googled or done any research on you. So I'm just asking these questions, kind of like I would with a client where I have no idea about their family history. And I just ask questions and we see how we go. And if I bump into something, we work through that. Does that all sound good? It's all sound good. I bought my crystal ball <laughs> just in case I need additional direction. You I played at her and I'm sure she will guide me too. I love it. The crystal balls are, are, are most welcome. So when I was thinking about what questions I really wanted to ask you, like the, the first one that sprung to mind is like knowing you socially and like I think your viewers, like this version of Jean Charles in the sofa with the robe, with the crystals, is the version I would see at a dinner party. This is what everyone sees. And what I'm curious about so having seen you at dinner parties or at parties, there is never a moment where you are in a corner, kind of feeling a bit depressed, not wanting to talk to people. That version I've never seen. You are a social butterfly, you'll move through the room, you'll say hi, you'll be entertaining, you'll be funny. I'm curious, maybe because I'm a bit more introverted, but are there times where that persona of Jean Charles disappears and you're like, man, Gina, I do not feel like going out. I'm so done. I would much rather just lie in bed and watch some Netflix. Uh, I can't be bothered to be me tonight. Like, it, does that exist? Very rarely, because being me is me. And Sabrina, I've never, ever pretended to play a role. Yeah. I've never designed a persona. I've never drawn a personality. I've really had the fortune over the last 30 years to really be myself. Amazing. I must say the only difference when I'm alone is I wear the same robe with nothing under me. <laughs> I didn't want to do that today because many of us are here. Yes. When I did mention it was important to be clothed yesterday. <laughs> yes, yes, clothes the key. But I really believe that to this question, I'm very attracted and energized by people. Yeah. And I strive uh, on people's energy and I love people's negative or positive energy because I always see it as an opportunity to have that energy move from those both opposite direction. If it's negative to positive, it's positive to extra positive. So. I write from it, I get energized by it, and I genuinely, as you do, adore being with people. So there's very rare time. The only depressing time I may have, if you were to put me by myself in a room where I would have nothing to play with, no pen to draw, no pen to write, no colors to be able to put on a piece of paper, or nothing to create. I think that would be the ultimate punishment where I will be very feeling deprived of everything. Okay. That's amazing. So a true extrovert, get your energy from people, different energies, creating. I like to be by myself for sure as well at some time, because you cannot just be with others all the time in that sense. Yeah. As I am on myself. I always have a dialogue with myself, whether it's my twin brother that doesn't exist or my psychological mind in this dialogue of creating something or designing something or creating a space like the one I'm in. I love to imagine and dream. And this is why today I selected those wines for you as the alchemy of dreams. I yes. really love as well to create. And I believe when I'm myself, I would love to write theater I would love to write and play within the roles I create. 
And I was reflecting on that last night as I asked my daughters to write every day three pages as a book. And we will read each other on December 31st what we've written. For the last two and a half weeks, I was thinking, having two hours by myself, let's say from 10 p.m. to midnight, to be able to write the story that I'm dreaming would be very exciting as well. So it's not that I don't want to be with others or I just love to be with others. If I'm by myself, I love to transcribe my imagination into others' actors within a play to create something where there's still interaction. Okay. So it sounds like that's also how you might process some things. You're not necessarily journaling or doing morning pages where you're like, yesterday I got really triggered when X and Y. It's much more sort of in some ways creative where you're using other characters and coming up with a theater production. Right. And yeah. I, don't, I don't use a journal per se, per day to say what I've done. Yeah. I use my artistic expression to basically translate what I feel or what I've lived, what I've experienced or what I wish to experience. This is why, whether it's fragrance, whether it's jewelry, whether it's design, I always transcribe in many ways my emotion that are obviously, you know, portrayed through what I'm designing. Yes, which most artists do. If you really get to know them, they are in some ways navigating their mood or processing their feelings through their art. And that's what actually compels them to create. What do you think, I mean, speaking of mood, when you are having a difficult day or week or month, some people, if they're having a difficult time, they'd go through more like heavy energy and feeling lethargic, or some would go more, slightly more manic and maybe more anxious. Where do you go with your mood, you know, on a difficult time? Like, do you go in any particular direction? I'm imagining you go into creation mode, or but I'm not sure. Well, indeed, and this year is the prime example, of course. I love, first and foremost, to release potential negative energy within sports. Okay. So I always use sports as the escape, whether it's jogging, tennis, soccer, uh, horseback riding, and over the last 10 years, it's kickboxing to really release energy. And it goes into sequence. If it's kickboxing, yeah. I feel myself as sometimes very frustrated by things not moving fast enough or yeah. implementing things or seeing outcomes not coming to the way you always wish they would yeah. through the sequence of the training. So I love to escape in sports. I love to obviously as well create and draw, which allows me to get into a space which is one neutral and then more creative, not just to escape, but to change my perception of what I may have perceived as being reality. I love so it. I love to flirt within the idea of reality and surrealism. Mm -hmm. and it is really, I think what I feel, I have a lot in touch with the surrealist era, whether it's Magritte, whether it's Duchamp, whether it's obviously Dali or Picasso or many others, because always flirting with the seen and the unseen, the real and the unreal. And it's not that I wanna build myself a movie of reality or irrealism, but I wanna to try to positive what I've lived into a new way of interpreting to be constructively positive for another outcome. I love it. So different avenues, of course. Different avenues. And let's go back a little bit in terms of your childhood. I know you've got a sister, is that right? Incredible sister. And she's the older sister or she's the younger sister? The oldest, the guiding sister, the intellectual. The intellectual. So the tell me, when you were kids, you know how often you might get a label ascribed to you where, oh, that's the clever one, that's the intellectual one, that's the funny one, that's the good looking one, that's the outgoing one. What were those labels? Because <laughs> I know she's watching, so I got to be very- You got to be, you, you got to be careful here. Um, and so what, what, what were those labels that you received or that your parents might have put on you where you were seen as what as a kid? I'm kind of imagining like this version of you back at age six, seven, eight, nine, like how did that go down? I don't know to what degree it was like a 
a strict family or a liberal family. Tell me a little bit about your childhood and that sibling order and who took what role, because usually siblings take roles in families. Do you have a sense of that? Absolutely. So very fortunately, my sister and I have always been very close. She's been an amazing sister, a guiding sister, a helping sister, an enlightening sister. She's been a great intellectual, a great athlete, and, and a great friend. So fortunately as well, we were living very closely with my parents and grandparents. Okay. All of us, very typically European on the same kind of compound, if you wish, yeah. where you interact as well with multiple generations. So I don't believe as my grandparents were both school teachers that they were labeling us as you're the athlete, you're the intellectual. I really believe they tried in a very traditional French European way to really cross nurture us into all kinds of activities. So very fortunately, uh, you know, similar to you, we were raised on the winery, in the winery too, because we lived in it. So we were all playing multiple roles. And that's the cool part of it is my sister and I built such a great relationship and I understood women, thank God, very early on because of my grandmother's mother and sister with whom I was all the time with. And my admiration for the intellectual development of ladies, the openness of their minds, and really the fabulous multitasking abilities they've had. So I feel, you know, I obviously went more probably into the sports category, mm -hmm more into the outgoing type, maybe more than my sister. She was four years older. We were raised in the 70s. Parents were very disciplined, okay. you know, specifically with ladies in those days. So I could go out more early. Right. I, I, I had the chance to experience a lot more freedom in a way maybe that she had because of the fact that sadly she was a lady and I was a boy. And even though I escaped through the window and nobody knew, and I would go out all night. She could not do as much as that, but she would do other things that really made her such a great balanced lady. So I would say really very fortunately, very natural life, very much on a farm or on a wine estates, uh, very organic in a sense, not only through the food and nature, but through the way we learned and we interacted. Okay. Finally, to your question, she's four years older, and the school system in France is by increments of four. So I say, sadly, we were never in the same school at the same time, although we fo I followed her. And she was, as a difference of a child, very studious, very much listening. And I was not as studious and very agitated and obviously always creating kind of the excitement and the electric energy within the room and certainly within the classroom, which allowed me to, to, to hear a lot, you're a good student, but I wish you would be more peaceful and more disciplined like your sister. Like so your sister. we're never okay. prepared as such, but she's always been really a very strong driving force, a um, very stable, phenomenal sister that still today in that sense, that has created a great balance between brother and sister. And would you have that feedback of, could you be a little bit less agitated and maybe create less electricity in the classroom? Would you have had the self-confidence to know that this was a skill or a, a positive trait to have? Or sometimes with kids at that age, we don't know that later in life, this will be helpful. So kids might go, oh gosh, I've got ADD. There's something wrong with me. Why can't I focus in the way that my sister does? So how would you have, what would your self-talk have been around that? Well, I'm not sure it was ever as well labeled within such strong, powerful world as ADD. Yeah. I'm attracted creatively to so many things. Yes. And I'm very fortunate that thanks to my grandparents and I really accounted to them, as school teachers, all of them into different capacities, I was curious into any topics. Okay. So I really believe what drove my agitation was always impatient of learning and impatient of feeling that the world is sometimes too slow okay. and feeling to be imprisoned within a system. And if we want to go deeper, I really feel 
the 70s and the early 80s, even though they were freedom years, from an adult standpoint, as a child specifically living in a small village in Burgundy, France, was very contained, was very disciplined, was very organized, and was so structured that I wanted to get out of that structure. And finally, you know, being fortunate as a child, not having to work at 12 years old, the same way to earn money, but having a comfortable lifestyle, I, I felt the world very organized and very stratified. And I'm fairly against those stratification of society, those organization of caste, if you wish, not that France is like India, but I love to revolt at a young age against the pre-established system of what society is about or what the expected is about. I believe in behavior and discipline to respect the freedom of others, but what I really believed in self-expression and creativity and allowing people to be themselves wherever they come from, whatever their background. And you know, France in the 70s, and this is why in the 80s, I was so attracted to the United States and America at large, is that freedom of mind, spirit and creativity and freedom of enterprise that you know you don't have as much, specifically in those days in France. And if we went back to some of those school friends of yours, would they have seen you as a bit of a rebel? And oh yeah, it totally makes sense that he ended up in California doing his thing. That was already visible by how you were rebelling or sneaking out of windows and kind of a bit done. Rebelling or thinking differently. And I was always, and I would say, if you talk to my old teachers and certainly my friends who are still today, my friends from very little age from six to 12, they would say the same thing, questioning the established process and rules and, and establishment. And I love that because I always ask why. I never like to take written rules for fact. And I think we should always challenge and push ourselves to question the existing uh, system that we live in and push the boundaries a little bit. And, and I was doing it in a very vocal way. I was doing it as well, you know, in a sense that I was always passing. Yeah. So similarly to what I do today in the wine country, I push the envelopes, but nobody can challenge us on the quality of the wines because yeah. they get the ranking Yes. Which is very high. So don't challenge me on winemaking. You could challenge me on the color of the red room. But I was always, you know, pushing it, but knowing that they would never be able to accuse me in a sense of not doing something I was still supposed to do. If you see what I mean. I do see what you mean. And I can see the replica with, you know, how you've um, handled your career and what you do in wine which I think is so valuable because it can get so stuffy and serious that then all the fun is kind of squeezed out of it yeah, and you were good at with Hess collection and the fabulous museum and and all the great things you undertake as well but remember this is about me but next time will be about you we're gonna yes yes but tell me a little bit more because I'm always curious that you have the confidence to do that, was that a process or your sense is I was born with this kind of confidence where I question the status quo. I never think, hey, I'm too much. Maybe I'll get rejected for this. It kind of feels like you have that innate confidence to do your thing. Thank you for asking that question because I think it's a great help for all the viewers as well. I had, and I have present term, amazing parents and I had incredible grandparents who always made you feel you could do something. So that's important. Number one, to be within an environment where you don't feel shackled or you feel that you could do it. And I was very fortunate in one area, which is not music, but which is sports. I was always quite uh, assertive there. So in soccer, as an example, I was you know, yes. the national team and so very quickly, you feel confident when you perform at the highest level in certain categories. It could have been music. I'm terrible at it. It could have been piano. I had to be attached at the piano by my grandmother to be able to go and play soccer. And if, if I did not try to perform for an hour, I would not be allowed to do that. But that was the only time 
I felt obliged to do something that I didn't want to do to be able to do something else. So I feel I get that confidence very early on. I got parents who encouraged it. I got a sister who was as well very positive. And I, I was raised, frankly, in a very positive, constructive environment. And I was very lucky that I got to touch the American taste in 81 when I was 11. Mm -hmm. I saw that if you, they're doing something, uh, it may succeed or you may want to dare. If you don't dare, it will never happen. And I was really encouraged at an early age. My parents, granted, started the winery in 61 and they became successful by daring doing things. So they were themselves a great role model. My mother was a ballet dancer and my father together started the winery. They did not know much about wine. My grandparents oh, yeah. were teachers and they did it by learning, doing, daring, being audacious, and really, you know, being entrepreneurial. So I think we were raised with that spirit, which I would recommend everyone to just dare. The only challenge you have in a French society, if you fail, you kind of mark for life. So the challenge of European society at large, and maybe more the French, if you fail on doing something, people will remind it to you. What I learned very quickly in the US, luckily, you fail, you could start again. The worst thing is not to learn from your mistake, but try again. Mm -hmm. And I feel this is moving in this direction in France, which is very encouraging, but it took a whole generation to accept to fail, you know? And I feel I was lucky because I came here early on and I did not have just success. I had many failures and many things I've done but luckily you could get a fresh start, forget about it, people do, and they allow you to move on. And how do you do that? Because I mean, that is so key because a lot of people are not daring, they're hiding a little bit because it's scary to put yourself out there because it could fail. And I kind of think all art or all creative processes, I mean, they're creative because they could fail. So there are no guarantees. So how do you talk to yourself? I mean, maybe you could go through maybe one or two failures where you're like, ugh. Oh, that really impacted me. And this is what I do to get myself back on track. Like well, what's the behind the scenes of your self-talk or maybe use crystals, I don't care what it is, but I'm, I'm, I'm keen to know the, the, the secrets. Well, you know, the secret is to allow yourself to fail and yeah. to allow you to say to yourself, we gotta go there because intuitively it feels right. So even though I did too long of studies at university, I really believe I should have probably after high school listened to my parents and grandparents who said, go to work right away and forget school. <laughs> and I know it's a bad advice for my daughters maybe, but coming from my grandparents who were school teachers says, at 17, you've graduated. Why don't you start working and do what you want to do? Because you know what you want to do. So I really believe it's um, a lot of intuition my failures have been by not measuring enough and being disciplined enough. But at the same time, the moment you are too disciplined, you don't create and go as fast. Mm -hmm. So one of my biggest failure in the wine world, in fact, has been in the early 2000s by creating an incredible range of meaningful wines, very socially responsible and very responsible on the environment. And maybe I don't consider them a huge failure because they impacted the wine world forever. But we were the first ever company on a big scale, not only to move into organic and biodynamic, but to go one step further into eco-friendly package, Tetra Pak, mm -hmm. aluminum bottles, and PET. On those three fronts, we were pretty much the first company ever to put fine wine in those. You could say maybe we failed because today we don't have any of those products anymore in the market except one brand. And I don't consider it a full failure because we influence all industry, but we were very early without having necessarily the means to push it to be as large as we want it. We've impacted liquor boards, we've impacted consumers, but at the end of the day, we failed because it did not sustain over 10 years or 15 years of success. So what do I learn from it? too early, not measuring the success enough, 
not being disciplined enough to keep building it, or maybe just simply having done too many of those at once, having too much energy into innovating in too many fields. That's a great things to analyze, I think, for the future. But I would say that was a failure in a sense. It allowed us to do more. And mm -hmm. today we're there, but we were too early. So maybe we fell by measuring as well the timing of the market that could have been too early. So it's fascinating because as I'm listening to you, I, I can see your process where you go straight into the analysis and the takeaways, the learnings, the bits that actually did work, but maybe the timing was too, too early, pieces like that. And you don't hang out at all, it seems, in the shit. I'm a loser, this didn't work, I feel despondent and depressed and I don't want to get out of bed, the numbers are shitty, um, how am I, you know, I'm screaming at my team or I'm collapsed inside, like you just don't do any of those feelings, you go straight into this very rational thought processes, which I think most people don't, they spend a bit more time in the grief, sadness, some version of I suck or I'm not good enough. Well, and I don't believe in, in negativism and I don't- I can tell, I can tell. And you know, it, it's interesting as we say that, why? My grandparents lived six years of war. Mm -hmm. They were very young, their life got changed because of six years of war and having kids during the war. And I've always learned, you know, you trace your path and you define who you want to be and you need to be responsible. And I think my parents taught us, hopefully, they would agree with that as they're listening, I'm sure, to be responsible and my sister and I are accountable. So I never want to blame anyone for anything I do. I'm ultimately responsible. Mm -hmm. so I really believe it's very important to take ownership not too much of success, but specifically failure. Mm -hmm. Because failures, ultimately, if you give people the green light, you know, they rely on you as hopefully the leader to have measured the pros and cons and analyze the SWOTs and whichever analysis you like to do. For me, I've always lived my life on intuition and following my heart, following my intuition, following my passion. Luckily, it's been more successful than not. But I believe if you follow your passion, you'll eventually be successful. And by being constructive with your own self without going to a deep depression, which doesn't bring anything. And I'm Agreed. always with people as you are more than I am, because you know how to cure them. Going through those deep ends, I never thought the deep ends was ever uh, a solution. I think it's like at soccer, my position was, forward center or forward right and left, I had to score. My mission on the soccer field is to score. If I didn't score, I need to ask myself and replay the moments, why did I fail in front of the goal and not scoring? And I was always a big scorer, you know, and this has been the same in everything I do in my life is I love to win, not just to win over people, but to make sure that I spend my time with positive, outcome and i really believe it's important to live your life that way whether it's in sports it's in living your day assessing your day assessing the journey you live assessing the relationship you have and building anything you do somehow you need to breathe in and look at it and always i believe in a positive way twist the negative into how you turn it into a, a great journey. Like yeah, the I love it. So a question on that, because I think it's a remarkable that you're able to do that and nearly naturally or intuitively. And then sometimes people who are able to do that where they don't spend a lot of time with grief and sadness because really kind of what's the point and it feels a bit heavy, it'll show up in their other relationships because they might be married or they might be parenting kids who then suddenly are not wired quite that way. Do you ever bump up against that where you're like, well, why is this person depressed or sad? I don't like, it's a bit frustrating or how do you deal with other people's sadness or heaviness? I don't know if Gina's ever sad. Uh, maybe you guys are all relatively um, positive. So it doesn't show up, but 
that would be a curiosity for me because very often like when we don't do feelings we're slightly allergic to when other people do lots of those feelings i don't know if that's true for well, you no absolutely and it resonates so well and this is why i created this series of wine that i love by the way for you as the wine expert. i love it alchemy of dreams we need to get onto dreams next i will have a sip absolutely and as you have a sip and analyze the wine i would say sabrina i live my life as a theater so I believe life is a sequence of acts and in the major play. This is why my favorite people are Dali, are Federico Fellini as a movie producer, are Walt Disney, or are those big thinkers that are really looking at life as a sequence and an evolution. So I live life as a game. And I really believe every day is a new game. And I look at people's energy as an exercise. And that's why I could adore doing what you do. And maybe I talk too much. That's probably why I couldn't be as good as you are. But I love to convert people's energy and take it up. So you mentioned crystals. You mentioned pendulum. You mentioned the rhythm of the inner clocks of people. I love with all the people surrounding myself to turn them into something that they're not. I considered it an exercise, an intellectual exercise and a challenge. And I love doing that. This is why I love people. You know, prior to this last year, I'm out all the time. I love people because I really feel for me, the resources in nature and people. Because I look at someone and I analyze it in such a way that I learn through and thanks to everyone. And I really genuinely do. I don't say that to be political. I seek energy from people, but I seek learning from people, just factual learning as well as emotional learning. And that's why I love going to bars, nightclubs and restaurants because I love to observe and I love to set myself objective with people. It's like the people you the least are attracted to. You go there and you say, I'm gonna make him or her a friend. And and how do you do that? Even if you're not attracted to them or they might have slightly heavy energy and you're like, I'm going to go over there. This is my mission. And then you just start talking or how do you convert their energy or connect? I figure out a way to get in and from there to try somehow to possibly become closer, get to know that person and get to try to understand why the vibration or the radiation I'm getting are negative if they are, or positive if they are, and how to get closer. I, I really see people for me as the most entertaining, the most exciting, the most fascinating. And you know, I make wine to meet people. Wine is the catalyst for me of conversations. Wine allows me to see, to visualize, to hear, to sense, to experience people. You know, why do I like a winery and I'm into the democracy of wine. You know, we make wine from $10 to thousands of dollars a bottle. It doesn't matter if you have no credit or black card. I don't care if you buy a million dollars of wine from us or $20. What excites me is to take you on a journey with wine or thanks to wine to get to know you better. I'm very fortunate that I'm authentically interested in people and I think people see that. That's why I have people around me because I genuinely am interested in them. Not yeah. for my own sake, but just to get to know them better and get to, hopefully if it's my you know, expression environment, to get them to go further than they think they can go. And that's always, for me, my interest assessment of having teams, whether it's sports or people, which is exactly the same thing, is is how do we all gonna do more, all gonna focus into our skills? Let's not delve into how bad we are in here. And if you are bad in there, go into your positive side and be exceptional there. Mm -hmm. And let's go there. And that's what I try to do at least with the world around me and myself. But Amazing, so, and it sounds like you've got that sensitivity to energy and then a way of doing relationships where you're trying to lift people up and keep the energy positive. A question about 
marriage, intimate relationships, long-term intimate relationships, which, you know, a lot of people will be nodding their heads, where sometimes the rubber meets the road here. No, when, when, if, when you and Gina are not getting on, what would that look like? Would that look... So some couples go slightly more cold and frosty and passive aggressive. Some people, it sounds a bit louder and there's an, a tangible kind of argument or fight. Where do you guys go or are you alchemizing her energy that nothing, no, no fights or disagreements or irritations happen? I'm kind of curious how that looks. Tension is because probably of me because I'm too impulsive, too intense and too forward. So. I would like, be like Jean Charles, you're too much, like turn it down, it's too quick, what are you doing? This is crazy I, or because I could be very, very intense. And and I think Gina has the ability, as you, because she has she has a degree in psychology to I didn't know that. be able to go to the balcony in a sense and look at things differently. So she's as well very intellectual. So she takes us to another place and she has the ability to be an amazing listener. So she let me probably go as a wild colt galloping into the direction I'm going and then slowly rein me back. So I think she's a great listener. She's an absolutely fabulous reader of mine and spirit. She knows me very well. And her ability is to let me go. And mm. that's the beauty of it. So we, I, I would say, very fortunately, we don't have arguments in a big way. I mean, luckily, you know, we often come to place very rapidly because, you know, she is bringing us to that place more than me. So I would say she's much more mature and maybe because she was raised with eight siblings to bring peace and to bring you to a place of compromise than maybe I don't have yet the ability to succeed to go yet. So she would be more the peacekeeper. She would be the calmer. She would be more psychologically uh, calming to allow us to take it to a notch and not react the same way as I would. Because as well, frankly, I'm Latin. <laughs> yeah, do you have a more fiery temperament then? Oh, that would make sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. I'm very expressive i'm very intense as you know i'm very bullish Does that mean quick to anger would things piss you off and then you're like oh and it would be visible i'm sure i'm a quick temper as well she's a short fuse too but <laughs> good to know you guys are human over there it's always good yeah you know i would say she's much more mature than i am in that sense she is uh, a greater listener as i said and I think she's a greater peacekeeper and she could take it in much more. Whereas in the ring, I attack. On the soccer field, I attack. On the tennis court, I'm service volley. I, I want to go forward. And she is much more strategic. You know, again, her whole sibling is a basketball team on its own. So she is a greater listener. And I think she's allowing us in the couple to be less of those fire personality. She's a water sign. So maybe she she brings that calmness cool things down. better. And I think she has this ability as you do. So by the way, what do you think about this Chardonnay from the Russian? I love it. I love it. And I particularly also love, I don't know if viewers can see, but we've got a very dreamlike sequence. Do you have any repeating dreams or have you had any repeating dreams since we're on the alchemy of dreams i know we should wrap up shortly I, I dream of so many great things and i dream alive i don't need to sleep to dream sabrina because like lucid dreaming type things or well no i'm as i talk to you i've had three dreams as i speak i dream of something i want to do what do you see i want to create right now I see an amazing world that I want to recreate that is very sensual, that is very sensory oriented, that people are within an environment where they cannot understand where the sense of smell and taste come from, but they feel it and they sense it. 
as if it would be an hallucination at all time. And I could see it through vapors of flavors. I could see it through touch. I see it through energy. And I, I often have double discussions with my own self. I talk to you and I think of something else. And it's very exciting because often, you know, and this is why the entrance of Raymond, I created those frames is the way you see the world, none of us do see it the same way. Same as a landscape. And I love to look at a piece of paper and say to myself, what do I see within it? Or what do I see within a wallpaper? Do I see a profile of a person? Do I see a heart? Do I see a landscape? Do I see the ocean? Do I see something material or immaterial? And I love to interpret this because I, I live in a world of interpretation of the unseen. And I love always to go behind that curtain and imagine the non-figurative way. In other words, I don't like surrealism. I don't like as much in painting naturalism. For me, painting the reality seems very uncreative. What I would want you to do if we were to paint together is see what maybe no one is seeing. Not mm -hmm. just see, like this famous painting of Magritte that I love, which is the lady horseback riding behind the trees and is literally intertwined the trees within the paintings. Or similar to this one, this is the view of Wapo Hill through your I eye. I didn't realize that. Okay. You could see the stairs of Wapo Hill taking you to the house you've been to many times. Yeah, incredible house. Vineyards, which is the alchemy of the senses through the bucolic to taste it. it. And this is not vine, but forks holding the vines because wine and food is correlated so much together. So it's fascinating. I know, I know we have to gradually wrap up. I think the piece that I'm taking away on my end is your lack of judgment about anything that floats into your head. You actually just go with it. So you can have this conversation, images or sort of physical sensations or your imagination is doing something at the same time. And you don't have a monologue of, I should be focusing on like Sabrina, or you are actually just absorbing and trusting your inner process without any critical thought, which is quite rare because most of us have some sort of negative talk going on and we don't fully trust these impulses. Exactly, and without being afraid to be judged in one yeah. way. And, you and should bottle that because that would be a bestseller if you could bottle the, um, the lack of fear um, of being judged, like going well, with your gut. I think it happens. comes really much about French society at large, where you judge by whatever you do, by however you behave, by whatever your manners are. And I love it in some parts, but I extract it on the other side where I don't believe in it. So, you know, I think judgment creates static world and create really rigid and frigid worlds. So I really believe we need to really work on the tangent of what is possible and impossible and, and really always believe that everything is possible as long as you put your mind to it. And this is what I believe I want to imprint my world, at least around it, is I design the world I want to live in. And this is ultimately what I've come to form over the last 30 years of my life is I wanted to be in the US, so I've designed my world to be in the US and a business eventually to accompany the wishes I've had. I designed those places that I want to be in and I want to take people along the way if they choose to like it, to be with me within that journey. So this is really important, I think, for me to instill in people as well or inspire others to design always and create not only the energy, the positiveness, the personal environment, and the places they want to be in for themselves. And finally, this is why I designed those label as a sketch. Same on our house. Is in that Wapo. you doing this? Yeah, so I don't paint them, but I sketch them. You sketch them. 
because I want to on the world to be the world I want you to see, not necessarily the world of someone else, but the world that comes from my own interpretation of the world. I want you to come to our environment, like behind me, it's Marilyn Raymond. I want you to see her on leopard grapes because of course you do. that's my interpretation of I love it. Napa Valley, of Cabernet, of luscious style and, you know, beautiful, rich, powerful, high cleavage wines. And this is what this she is it. Like. I love it. Well, I will drink to that. I really want to thank you for being so open and vulnerable, going with all these questions, um, even though you had no idea what was coming at you. And I've gotten a little bit more insight into how you work. So if we could bottle that, we would, we would, we would, we would be doing well. So cheers. And so I'm much. pleased we did it this way, though. I think, I think this is, yeah, it's just such an interesting angle that I don't, and I think a lot of people often don't get to see behind the scenes of like how you work and how you think. So lots more questions, but we will leave it here. Cheers to you for thank doing it. And thank you for all the wines that I've now got. We're going to have to have another session when you give me true advice on how <laughs> and what to work on and psychologically yeah. what to improve. You know, that's so far, so far, I think you're doing well. So we'll leave it there. So thank you so much. Lovely to see you. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Bye.